Hello and welcome back ladies and gentlemen to another Historical Humans Reacts and in today's episode we have yet another follow-up. We talked just the other day about how updated federal regulations are starting to kick the North American Graves and Repatriation Act or NAGPRA into high gear forcing institutions to reel. Well, one of these examples is the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, which just closed um, two, per two ex exhibition halls permanently due to the updated fe federal regulations. And it, at first, it sounds really shocking, and it is definitely meant to an elicit a reaction. However, this may not actually be a bad thing overall. Yeah, um... It's important to note that the uh, Natural History Museum here has chosen to shut down, I believe, 10,000 square feet of space um, rather than uh, do what they probably should have been doing for the past um, almost 30 years at this point, uh, which is working with the people whose stuff they had to figure out what they could keep and what they couldn't. And Because you don't. Why Why not? Why wouldn't you? Well, so the thing is, this law has been in place for 34 years at this point. That law was signed into um, law in 1990. However, a lot of museums, institutions, and repositories actively worked against the law because they did not want to relinquish ownership or control over artifacts to Native American tribes or indigenous groups that were requesting the items. And per the letter of the law for the 1990 Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, it states that if cultural heritage can be uh, identified, the item must be uh, repatriated to that descending community or group. And a lot of institutions and museums and universities would claim that there is no cultural heritage or that there is no link between groups or that it's unfeasible to think they come from the same groups to prevent that from actually coming into place. So it, the enforcement of the law up until this point has been very loose, very lax, and it hasn't had the most uh, quote unquote teeth that mo that a lot of laws tend to have. Yeah. And, and one of the things that really becomes prominent in this article specifically um, that they discuss is the fact that institutions have thousands of artifacts if they are small. Large institutions like the um, American Museum of Natural History has millions, hundreds of thousands to millions of artifacts. So a lot of them are struggling to just catalog and to have full inventories of everything that happens. And I know the knee-jerk instant reaction is, how do you not know what you have? But these institutions are old, they've been around for a long time, their collection methods have changed, and believe it or not, a lot of times people will just drop off collections at the doorstep without any sort of context, any sort of information, and we refer to those as orphaned collections. And it happens a lot of times when people die and their family goes, I have no clue what we have. So they think, ah, oh, we'll just give it to the museum. Yeah, and... The, the key thing here for this article or uh, interview that we are looking at is, you know, this is a 34-year-old law that is suddenly causing all these changes in, um, in this museum. So the question is, what has changed? And uh, people in the interview, interview give a very good point. And I think the second point that they make for what's changed is uh, what is most relevant, which is it used to be with a lot of these collections that it was on the Native American tribes to find out that it was in there and know that it was in there and contact the museum and say, hey, you have stuff that belongs to us. Now it is on the museum to say, we have Native American stuff and we have done all these efforts to try and find a tribe that matches them, as opposed to the tribe having to somehow know what the Smithsonian is hiding in its basement that isn't on any sort of public list or registry or yeah. having any sort of access to the itemized lists. Yeah. So, yeah. Like even just getting in there is just not going to be easy. I mean, for God's sakes, like they don't just let anybody walk in, even if people who could actually go in and check. Yeah. And 
yeah, and, you know, that is that is the big key thing is that now it's on the museum to contact the tribes, not on the tribes to contact the museum. And number two, uh, which is their first point, the um, museums can no longer uh, use unidentified artifacts for display and research purposes without consulting the tribes. They can't just sit there and go, uh, there's no idea who this is, so we're going to put it on display. <laughs> Yes. You have to actually, you have to actually get the tribes per, like written consent in order to do a lot of these things. It's forcing the institutions to actually do what they should be doing. So this ends up just forcing the institutions to do what they should have been doing right along, in which that they should be contacting the indigenous tribes, they should be reaching out for permission to display the object, if not just outright repatriating it. This is a long-fought battle that many of the indigenous nations in the United States have fought for relentlessly because there was a period of time, and the interview actually does mention this, where collection methods were different and standards were different where maybe things weren't willingly given to the museum instead they were taken borrowed without consent um any number of way you would like to justify it they had uh not the best ethics behind it i mean i get it like you know times were different I like I understand like you know if this was like 200 years ago but you've also been displaying them still yeah, like if like... you actively understood that times were different when they were first displayed why didn't you take them down sooner it, 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 times being different when you acquire the object is no excuse for not keeping up with the times that you are currently living in um I, I will say that right there as like a counter to like any 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 sort of argument of like, well, we got it when it was okay to do this. But is it okay now? No, it is not. Was it yeah, I was like, yeah, was it really even okay then? <laughs> and the there is a certain argument which they do mention that an unnamed archaeologist was visiting, which you could tell it was a boomer archaeologist based on what they said. They they said if people can't research these objects, the stories are going to be lost to history. And there is a, a certain level of validity in the argument that institutions are the proper establishment to research them. However, the, the bottom line and the end goal for all of this is we should not be the ones to dictate what should and shouldn't be studied. And to be but, honest with you, in my experience and in a lot of the things I've seen, a lot of times the indigenous communities will take better care of the artifact than museums will. Because a lot of times museums will have it languishing in an archive somewhere, in the stacks buried deep in a box somewhere, where God knows what what potential issues could be going on, whether it be um, pests, rodent, mold. Whereas a lot of times these indigenous institutions that have been popping up, because a lot of tribes are starting to build their own repositories, or starting to come together and work with institutions to do a better overall job about trying to care for these historically repressed people. Um, I know I speak a lot from my experience, but I know the Wisconsin State Repository for all of their artifacts has an entire room dedicated to repatriation ceremonies with the tribes. That alone is a massive partnership. It's, it's, it's a good thing that they're doing there, yeah. And it the sad thing is, it's rare. It's so rare to see that. And it, it boils down to the fact that this memorandum that is forcing institutions to start following this law is the fact that the law has not been properly enforced to the point that these institutions have gotten away with it for 30 years. The article makes it sound like it's some stark change and some stark contrast where the museum is shutting down two whole exhibition halls because of this, but it's because the museum wasn't doing what they should be from the get-go. Yeah, it, it is a stark change to what the museum is doing because for the first time in 30 years, 
the law has been given teeth to be enforced and suddenly the museum is like oh right we've been committing crime all these decades <laughs> gosh who <laughs> why didn't someone tell yeah. us sooner the secret ingredient yeah. is the crime yeah if yeah if only curators could read <laughs> yeah, basically gosh uh, but in, in at least my opinion i think this is a long long overdue step uh, a lot of my personal academic research uh that my my degrees are based off of is literally trying to give indigenous communities their opportunity to to control the narrative for once after centuries of repression and genocide and cultural assimilation forced assimilation it's good to see some autonomy returned and for them to be the final voices to dictate what happens and this whole idea that research will no longer happen there's a lot of brilliant brilliant indigenous academics out there who are conducting the research but they are doing it in a culturally sensitive way to their own peoples it's crazy how that is such a foreign idea in this field, and it is one of the reasons why, unironically, we need to get the dinosaurs out. Well, maybe not out of the Natural History Museums, but we should certainly be getting the indigenous peoples out of them. Yes, and when I say <laughs> yeah, that's a good start. When I say dinosaurs, I mean the archaic ancient people that have run these institutions for decades and refuse change and refuse to adapt to the modern day. We are, of course, we are, of course, not refusing, uh, uh, referring to the fossils. The fossils should very much remain in the museum. Yes, the dinosaur fossils, 100%. I have been to the American Museum of Natural History, and I have seen the dinosaur bones. Those are cool. I yeah. like the dinosaur However, bones in the Field Museum. <laughs> I just don't want to see The human ones shuffling remains. around the corridors. Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> but... Yeah, this is this is an interesting change, and it's a cool change in policy, and it's good to see. But it's very, very long overdue. Yeah. And I think that's actually a great point for us to wrap up on this video because we have had technical difficulties and a very, very in-depth conversation that's going to ruffle a lot of feathers. I know a lot of people feel very strongly. And just one last talking point about this article. They talk about how the hall is normally very boring that they said themselves. And because of news of it shutting down, it now has been packed. So, you know, eh, humans are it, humans. It, it's one of those things. But, like, yeah, no. Uh, there's nothing quite like, uh, you know, trying to evict the entirety of your predecessors. <laughs> uh, but thank you guys for watching. We'll see you in the next video. If you have strong opinions, let us know down below. Let us know what side you're on. And be sure to argue your hearts out. We love to see it. Thank you guys for watching.